from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the Library of Congress. We're very pleased to have you here. My name is John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress. And today, as you know, we have a very special and only slightly mysterious event taking place. <laughs> so we're going to keep you guessing as long as we can and postpone the surprise towards at least the second part of the program. Uh, we would like to uh, welcome the mysterious family of the mysterious <laughs> new ambassador. At least 12 of them are here, and we're very grateful to have their support of not only uh, for their relative, but also for the idea of a na national ambassador for young people's literature. You are in the Thomas Jefferson Building. If those of you who've not been here before, Thomas Jefferson is one of the founders of the Library of Congress, and we're very pleased to welcome you into this glorious hall of writers. As you go out through the great hall, look up, and you'll see the names of writers, not so much in this room, but where the Christmas tree is as you go out in the great hall of the Library of Congress. And this building does symbolize the importance of writing and the written word, something which is very important, of course, uh, for us in this new program. The Center for the Book works closely with the Children's Book Council uh, in hosting this, this program and this project. And before we start, I would, to, would like to recommend, <laughs> recommend, to recommend and recognize Robin Adelson, uh, who's here representing the CBC. Uh, Robin, there you are, standing. We're very... <laughs> the program started uh, about three years ago when Robin wrote uh, to the Library of Congress with a suggestion that this uh, program uh, be part of a national program to promote young people's literature. And she wrote to the Center for the Book, which was created in 1977 to help stimulate public interest in books and reading and now literacy in libraries. And I'm fortunate that the, li the Library of Congress was in a position to, uh, with certain modifications, uh, to accept this invitation and to work jointly with the Children's Book Council in developing this program. Uh, the person who is responsible for approving this and pushing us forward with this project is the 13th Librarian of Congress. His name is James Billington. Uh, Dr. Billington has uh, pushed the Library of Congress ahead in all kinds of ways of new technology, but he is a scholar of Russian culture and of book culture, and in fact, as he will tell you and has told the staff many times, uh, the efforts on part of the new digital technology are all part of moving forward to emphasize the importance of books, reading, and book culture in our society. The Librarian of Congress is named by the President of the United States. Dr. Billington was nominated by President Ronald Reagan in 1987 and confirmed unanimously by the U.S. Senate. And it's my pleasure now to present the 13th Librarian of Congress, Dr. James H. Billington, Dr. Billington. Thank you very much, John. Uh, welcome everyone here to this um, Temple of the Book, which is really what this Jefferson Building is, right out there. If you were to go to the adjacent room, you would see Woodrow Wilson's personal library. This is a library of books of many other things, but the book culture and the library of Thomas Jefferson, which we've reconstructed and you can see upstairs, um, was the core around which was built. And Jefferson said he couldn't live a day without books. And when somebody said, why should you be, why should the Congress buy all of Thomas Jefferson's books to restart the library after the original library was burned? And um, 
he, uh, they pointed out that a lot of these were dealing with the flora and fauna of some distant place, and he said there's no question on which uh, a legislator in our type of uh, civilization might not need to know. So this idea of knowledge-based democracy and knowledge as in books, uh, it's not just information, it isn't just knowledge, it's wisdom and the practical wisdom that you get from reading books and using your imagination. He said memory, reason, and imagination are the three ways of organizing knowledge and in a way imagination is the most important, particularly for young people. And that's what we're celebrating today. <clears throat> and I want to celebrate and again commend John Cole for his leadership of the Center for the Book over a very long period of time and for, for really being the organizing and animating spirit uh, of this particular ambassadorship which we're celebrating today. <clears throat> And we have not one, but <clears throat> excuse me, two ambassadors in our midst. So first I'd like to thank our current National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, John Sheska. John is the author of such hilariously subversive children's books <clears throat> as The Stinky Cheese Man, The True Story of the Three Little Pigs, and so forth. Millions of children nationwide and around the world love his books. He is not only an author of acclaimed books for young people, he is also a tireless advocate for the importance of reading, especially, he says, among boys, who surveys show read less than girls do. Uh, yeah, so he's really been a, a very unique ambassador. He got this program started. His Guys Read website is dedicated to changing this statistic about boys not reading as much as girls. And he has traveled the nation employing his wicked sense of humor to entertain children and their parents, all the while educating them on the wonders of reading. Uh, John, during your two years as national ambassador, you ably and with distinction represented the Library of Congress, its Center for the Book. You were our literary literacy messenger who traveled on behalf um, of the library and our wonderful collaborator, Ms. Edelson, has already been hailed and thanked. Uh, and we received reports from those you visited thanking the library for instituting this worthwhile, important program. Um, so, John, we thank you very sincerely uh, for being our inaugural ambassador. We wish you much success in your future literary endeavors. I know that you'll continue to deliver the good word on literacy and reading wherever you go and spreading joy as well as the, the benefits of reading. It's actually fun. You've made it fun. We're very much in your debt. So please join me in a round of applause for our first and founding ambassador, John Chester. <laughs> I also want to thank John for a wonderful two years on behalf of both uh, Robin and the Children's Book Council and the Center for the Book. Uh, it's been quite an adventure uh, starting a new program with a personality like John who helped shape the program and helped shape what has gone on. I'm going to give a few highlights of John's two-year period and he has to sit here and watch this before we hear from John, and we'd like to hear a little bit about his impressions of his first couple of years. Uh, here he is. This was a photograph in the announcement issue of the New York Times when John was a named ambassador. <laughs> now this, there may be another ambassador getting a similar medal here, but don't count on it, but actually you might as well count on it. And Catherine, oops, the secret's out. Um, you don't have to flex when you get it, you can just accept it. Uh, one of the events, uh, John always talked a little bit about wanting some benefits from the government from this illustrious post, and one of them was he wanted, among other things, his own helicopter. Uh, at one of his appearances at the Library of Congress, I was able to provide a helicopter. <laughs> it wasn't quite what he had in mind, but nonetheless, it represented uh, John's aspirations for this job. Now, he also 
really would like an armored car and an airplane, but the best we could do was the helicopter. One of the uh, jobs, wonderful jobs, of the national ambassador is to appear at our national book festival. Uh, the Library of Congress is about to host its 10th national book festival on the Mall on September 26th. I hope many of you can join us. Here you see John uh, making a presentation uh, at one of the several events, and with him are two of his colleagues, uh, Mary Bridget Barrett, who is with us today in the lower picture, and, and illustrator Stephen Kellogg. Uh, they are part of a wonderful group of illustrators. Catherine is also part of this a wonderful group that we are working with in many programs. National Ambassador Duties and Attributes. Uh-oh, here we go. This is looking, this is the Center for the Book office where I'm explaining something to John. I'm not sure he's really listening, but he's trying. <laughs> Dr. Billington, John and myself on the balcony. John on the road. One of the wonderful things that has happened was that John immediately took on the ambassadorship with a cloak that was Robin had presented to him at the first luncheon we had once he was announced. And he played the role of the ambassador naturally uh, as part of at least three different book tours. And here he is on the road. Uh, John has an obvious affinity with children. There's Knucklehead, one of the three books that he produced during the year, during the two year period. Very reverent man in every possible way. You can see great respect, not only for his medal, but for the whole idea of the ambassadorship. It just, it just is evoked by John and his, his presence. Uh, a great willingness to share. And I must say that a number of these photos have been taken from the website that the Children's Book Council and the Center for the Book have developed uh, for the National Ambassador. And we hope that you will keep up with the activities of the next national ambassador, whomever she may be, um, on the new website, on the website. A man of many faces. Uh, for the kids who are here and for the adults as well, part of the general new picture at the Library of Congress is the opening of the first Young Reader Center, which was opened in October down in this wonderful building down on the ground floor. And after our event is over, the kids who are our special guests will be able to visit. Uh, many of them have already seen the Young Reader Center and have refreshments there as well. But down in the Young Reader Center, we have books and promotional items uh, regarding the National Book Festival. And this is where uh, my colleague, Guy Lamalinara, who prepared these slides, thank you, Guy, uh, came up with the idea of all these bald heads. A uh, healthy dose of cynicism, oops, and finally, of course, an intense seriousness reflected in this photo taken in Dr. Billington's office over in the Madison building. And that is our thank you tribute to John, and I would like to call on him again to give us some reflections on your first two years. Let's give John another hand. <laughs> Wow, I don't think I was ready to see all that. <laughs> but as you can see, I still have my medal. They can't take it away from me because it's got my name on it. And it is spelled correctly, which is kind of unusual. But I have some advice for the incoming ambassador, and is that don't wear this to the airport. Because <laughs> I tried that a couple times. And even if it's in your bag, they'll look at it and take it out and they'll go, what is this exactly? And then it takes a long time to explain and they make you stand around in your underwear and it just gets awkward after that. Well, uh, today I have mostly just a bunch of thank yous. This has been the most spectacular event to be an ambassador for two years. I got to go around the country and just mess around with everybody. And since I was the first ambassador, I got to just make up things as I went along and people had to believe me, which was kind of nice. Um, so in fact, my vice ambassador, whose name is Dave Shannon, and people didn't know that I got to appoint a vice ambassador, but I told them I do. So I did, <laughs> Catherine, you can, or K, K, you can, KP. 
So my vice ambassador taught everyone how to do the ambassador salam. He told a bunch of kindergartners, he said, you know, when you say hello and goodbye to the ambassador, you don't just say hello or goodbye. You actually have to raise your hands and go like, oh. oh. <laughs> so that's on YouTube. You can look up Ambassador Salam, and there's 250 little kindergartners going, oh. oh. <laughs> so use that one too, incoming ambassador who shall remain nameless. But I wanted to start by saying thank you to all the people who made this possible. And I have to start with my lovely wife, Jerry Hansen, who put up with all kinds of stuff. <laughs> thank you, Sudi. <laughs> oh, good, good, good salam, dear. <laughs> it took a lot of training, but she still does it. <laughs> Though it may be all over after today. And to the Children's Book Council, Robin and her whole crew standing there, Kelly and Rebecca and Meg. A big round of applause, please. <laughs> Thanks, guys. They also made a lot possible, like when I didn't answer emails and things, they would just pretend they were me and write them. Don't tell anyone else that, though, okay? Uh, Dr. Billington and his wife, certainly, thanks for all the support. You guys made this possible by telling people that this was a real position. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they wouldn't let me in the doors all the time. I told them I had an office here, too. I don't yet, but... John Cole and his Center for the Book, thanks so much. My vice ambassador, again, I'd like to say thank you. And all the authors and illustrators who do children's books, because I got to just walk around the country and tell them about books that I liked. And there's all kinds of great books out there. So I got to hang out with guys like Jeff Kinney, who did Diary of a Wimpy Kid, or J.K. Rowling. I said, but too bad you're not from this country, otherwise I'd talk about you more. <laughs> she didn't seem to care. Uh, <laughs> and the librarians and teachers and booksellers across the country who supported me and gave me the craziest bunch of stuff. KP, get ready for lots of crazy stuff. Because <laughs> not only did I have Robin's Superman cape, I got sashes, like a nice red sash with blue letters on it a green satin sash with gold puffy paint letters, and I brought along something that I wanted you to listen to. It's the Ambassador Fanfare. And it was composed by a fifth grade in California. They thought the ambassador should have something every time he comes in and out of a building, or a room, or his home. <laughs> and this is it. And so I play this everywhere I go, and it annoys people a lot too the Ambassador Fanfare. Nice, huh? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> so those instruments you heard were a kettle drum, so if you can get a kettle drum, that's good, and a trumpet, and a trombone, and a xylophone. So when I walked in, it was a kindergarten audience again, and all these little guys were sitting in the room going like, what is this guy talking about? And they played the fanfare, and I walked in. And I liked it so much, I walked in and out like four or five times. <laughs> which really puzzled the kindergartners. They were going like, who is this guy? Make him leave, please. Um, I'd also like to thank the bloggers, the kid lit bloggers. Yesterday online, um, a blog by the title of A Year of Reading decided last week that they would have a Thank John Cheska Day. So yesterday, over like 50 bloggers just wrote nice things about me which I don't get to read all the time, so now I have that going for me. So thanks, bloggers. And finally, I would like to thank the mysterious incoming ambassador, because now I don't have to travel around quite as much, <laughs> and I can still make reservations at restaurants and hotels as Mr. Ambassador Sheska. <laughs> so if you ever want to get good service at a restaurant or a hotel, just call yourself an ambassador because I found people kind of hop to a little more quickly. 
<laughs> so thanks so much. I'd like you to think of this not as losing your ambassador, though. You're gaining an ambassador. I think it was Robin Adelson who put it that way. Uh, and so now we all have to say that. <laughs> and if you're the ambassador, we're just going to keep adding ambassadors every couple years until there's more of us than there are of you. <laughs> and then everyone will have to read. They won't have a choice. And I want you to know that actually this incoming ambassador, who is a top secret, is, has also already been named a living treasure by the government, so I don't know where else you can go after this living treasure. <laughs> and to our friends at the White House, I would like to thank them for making this possible and tell them just like maybe they should help us a little more in this venture, because this is the most important thing. We are making the difference. We are making those people who are going to be our informed citizens. So thanks, guys. From your ambassador, over and out. I would maybe just leave you with one little thought that goes something like this. More like that. <laughs> it's a sad moment for me. See, I'm hanging on just as long as I possibly can. <laughs> I would love this ambassadorship to just be forever. Dun, 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 dun. That's it. Thank you, guys. For the long anticipated announcement, I would like to reintroduce Dr. James Billington, the Librarian of Congress. Dr. Billington. Well, it's a great pleasure to announce our next National Ambassador for Young People's Literature for 2010-2011. <clears throat> her name, first clue, her name is familiar to lovers of great literature, both here in the United States as well as around the globe. She's among the most honored writers in the world today, and she brings to the position a passion for instilling a love of reading from a very early age. You know, the telling of stories is the oldest thing in the whole communication and bonding of communities in the world. And we're building, together with UNESCO, a world digital library, which will take the original stories of all 192 countries, ideally. They're all, there are cultures that are all represented already on it. But those stories have been enshrined in books, and it's one thing that unifies the world because everyone can share a good story, but not everyone can write a great story. And we have with us today someone who writes great stories. Great stories because they're stories about real people. They're about specific people. They're about people who have difficulties but manage somehow to overcome them. They're inspiring as well as captivating. <clears throat> they reflect a young, a young life in China, a later knowledge of Japan, great honors in Europe and throughout the world. And she's right here with us, very American and wonderful storyteller. Her books of critical as well as popular favorites, Bridge to Terabithia, Jacob, Have I Loved, the great Gilly Hopkins, all of these and many more have placed her in a pantheon <clears throat> of great writers of universal appeal. These books tackle subjects such as the death of a close friend, sibling rivalry, <clears throat> the search for one's biological parents, things that real people have experienced. And as she once put it, I don't have it exact words, but <clears throat> these characters walk into me at times, and they, they change my life while I'm writing about them. And they change people's lives and people's feeling for life when they read them. I must say adults as well as children. <clears throat> Her latest novel, uh, The Day of the Pelican, is a moving and dramatic story of a refugee family in flight from war-torn Kosovo to America. As you can see, this writer does not shy away from difficult themes. In fact, 
her eloquent prose captures the very essence of the way in which young people are forced to confront tragedies, conflicts, problems that adults spend their lives trying to protect them from. <clears throat> Difficulties and challenges overcome. That is what she tells us about. Uh, through their experiences, she speaks to the nature and power <clears throat> of the human experience. This author's work is really a tales of humanity at its best and most inspiring. And of course, the person I'm referring to is the great Catherine Patterson, the new national ambassador for young people's literature, who is here with us today with her husband and great companion, John. We are honored, and with all your, your relatives as well, <clears throat> to welcome the new national ambassador for young people's literature. <clears throat> Catherine, will you please step forward, join me here, and receive this medal, which will give you problems with the airlines, <laughs> but as a source of our great This one really <laughs> especially good. <laughs> She'll be back. We believe in treating all ambassadors equally, and we have a slideshow that will remind you of some of Catherine's work, and then we will hear from her. And also, I want to uh, tell the kids there's going to be a chance for you to ask questions of our new national ambassador. Uh, Catherine, uh, uh, Dr. Billington has already, let me see if I can go back and see where we're at the beginning. There we go. Uh, here are photos of C uh, Catherine, who has a long, illustrious career uh, as a writer, as Dr. Billington said, and as not only a writer, but a popular figure, uh, well-loved by kids, by authors, um, and by a long group of friends who have supported her through the years. Here she is in action. Here are a couple of her books, and I know the kids will recognize some of these uh, book jackets. Uh, the great Gilly Hopkins, uh, The Master Puppeteer, a couple of these are books which Dr. Billington referred to, uh, Bridge to Terabithia, uh, Jacob I Have Loved, again, familiar books. In the Young Reader Center, we are developing a collection of Newberry and Caldecott winning books, and of course, we love having those gold stickers you know, on these books which show that they've been recognized by people. Uh, and in the Young Reader Center, the collection is there. It's not a formal Library of Congress collection. It's a browsing collection where people can take books off the shelves, read to each other, and also uh, look at kid-friendly sites on the internet, and also enjoy uh, videos of book festival performances by well-known children's authors such as John Cheska and Catherine Patterson. Uh, John referred to an award that the Library of Congress gave Catherine during our bicentennial year. We were 200 years old in the year 2000, uh, and we selected a number of writers and cultural figures uh, who were awarded, and Catherine was one of those. Uh, Catherine, we're going to develop a better picture if, as this slide presentation develops. And also, I point out that the figure, uh, the metallic figure, is actually not Catherine at all. <laughs> that, that is a figure off the metal, and we soon will be replacing that photo as well. But we have two years to work on this, and so we're pleased. Uh, Catherine also uh, is a founder and a vice president of the National Children's Book and Literacy Alliance. And Mary Bridget Barrett, who was one of her co-founders, is here. And I mentioned Mary Bridget, did, are you here someplace? Would you like to take a bow? All right, there you are. Thank you. And we, are, we are grateful to Mary Bridget and uh, her colleagues in the National Children's Book and Literacy Alliance for another reason, and that is the development of a special feature on a new website, read.gov, that has been developed by the Library of Congress but is administered by the Center for the Book. And on this is a wonderful 
uh, story being developed called uh, the, uh, I'm blanking, John. <laughs> Exquisite Corpse Adventure. I was trying to remember, we can't say Exquisite Corpse, it's the Exquisite Corpse Adventure because it's a story uh, and it's being developed, a serial story being developed by a number of well-known authors with John starting out and other authors every two weeks are adding their own chapters and so it's a spontaneous reaction to a story that we don't know quite how it's going to turn out. And Mary Bridget has, and her group have helped us develop the story. Um, I will go back also, though, to say something about Catherine's long association with U.S. Board of Books for Young People. This is an international dimension to the ambassadorship that I believe through Catherine's interest and her involvement and the awards that she's received from uh, international library and literacy groups will add a, yet another dimension to the notion of the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Uh, here, we don't need to read through all of these to give you a sense of the awards that Catherine has already received uh, for her work through the years. Uh, one of the major awards was the Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award in 2006. It's the most prestigious children's and young adult literature award internationally. And there's a picture of Catherine in Stockholm receiving uh, the award. Uh, it shows the international recognition that she has and that she brings to uh, the award and to our endeavor. Honorary degrees, a number of honorary degrees, a number of literary uh, awards listed by book title. And I believe the book that we are giving today to the kids is Robin? Bread and Roses. Bread, Bread and Roses too. So this for the young people who are here today will have a chance to have this book autographed uh, as they also take their new National Ambassador Cookie with them to the Young Readers Center. More awards, more awards, more <laughs> awards. And that's it. Now may I reintroduce our new National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, Katherine Patterson. Katherine. already made my first boo-boo in my new uh, uh, position, but I think I get dip diplomatic immunity, don't I? <laughs> uh, well, it's wonderful to be here today. And uh, John, John did the thank yous very graciously, and I need to thank many of the same people, uh, beginning with, of course, Dr. Billington uh, for his graces introduction and to uh, John Cole and, the, and my longtime friends at the Center for the Book uh, and here in this wonderful library, to my, more, uh, my newer friends at the, the Children's Book Council, thank you very much, uh, to uh, the uh, uh, publishers, uh, and I, people wonder why I have so many, it's just that I've followed the same editor around for years, <laughs> and she moves, so I move. <laughs> um, and they uh, gave us a lovely party last night. Thank you, Clarion and Houghton Mifflin for that. Uh, I also need to thank John Cheska, our terrific inaugural ambassador. Uh, I told someone today that I could not fill his shoes, but I would try to walk in his exalted footsteps. Uh, I think he's probably the only other person in the room who knows how thrilled I am to be here uh, today. And there are many people in this room uh, who have been with me on the long journey towards this place. Uh, most of them know me very well. Indeed, uh, Patterson friends and relations are like rabbits <laughs> <coughs> in the house at Pooh Corner. And I'm, I'm grateful to all of you, uh, especially to my husband, John, of, for, who has been for 47 years my chief support, not to mention cheerleader, and my four children who thought I was famous before anybody else had ever noticed me, <laughs> and uh, for my longtime editor of 40 years, uh, Virginia Buckley, who was to have been here today, but unfortunately got a germ from her 
grandchild <laughs> and didn't make it. But I'm sure that when she, my first manuscript was plucked from this flush pile and handed to her, she had no idea of the years we would spend together. But without her perceptive eye and gentle hand, I certainly wouldn't be here today. When I'm talking with young readers, I'm nearly always asked when I first knew that I was going to be a writer. And so I answer by saying, would you like to hear my first published work? And they usually say yes, and so I can recite my first published work. Would you like to hear my first published work? <laughs> it goes like this. Pat, 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 there is the rat. Pat, pat, where is the cat? Pat, pat, pat. <laughs> this was published, thank you, John. <clears throat> I always laugh for John, so he feels obliged to laugh for me. <clears throat> this was published in the Shanghai American School newspaper uh, alongside uh, a letter from the teacher that said, our second graders' work is not up to our usual standards this week. <laughs> so my first published work was published alongside my first critical review. <laughs> so did I know at seven that I was going to be a writer? Of course not. Did anyone note that I was showing early promise of becoming a writer? No, indeed. Not a soul. And no one, especially me, would blame them one bit for failing to encourage me based on what they read. But something must have happened. Even I can tell that my work has improved over the last 70 years. <laughs> so what did happen between the publication of Pat, Pat, Pat and our celebration today? And to that, I have one answer, and that is reading. It started before I was born. My mother was already in the habit of reading to my older brother and sister. And when I arrived, I was included in that magic time. I can still recite almost by heart, James, James, Morrison, Morrison, Weatherby, George Dupree, took great care of his mother, though he was only three. James, James said to his mother, Mother, he said, said he, you must never go down to the end of the town if you don't go down with me. And to my childish glee, peppered with a sprinkle of anxiety, it was the mother who proved to be the disobedient one, not the responsible three-year-old. I could go on with my childhood delights, which when I had my own four children, I loved to reread. Five of us gathered on the double bed. Lynn and Mary on each side of me, and John and David on either end, so they couldn't touch and poke each other. <laughs> In addition to my own childhood favorites, there were many new books when my children came along, quite wonderful books. I can't remember how many times we read Charlotte's Web on that bed, but I do know that each time we approached the end, John would say, don't cry, Mom. You ruin it when you cry. <laughs> But of course, by the time we got to page 78, I was weeping uncontrollably and would have to hand the book over to a child to finish. <laughs> Between those two scenes of mother's reading, there were the years when I read on my own. Because I moved so often and was thought in each new location to be quite strange to my classmates. Often my closest friends during those school years were the ones I met between the covers of books. The friends I've found in books not only helped me to understand myself better, but they made, me, made it possible for me to come to understand and reach out to other people. I remember how comforted I was reading The Secret Garden. Here was another child exiled from the land in which she would, had been born. Mary Lennox was so like me. She was terribly lonely and had a fearful temper, but imperfect and unlovable as she was, she was given the key to a secret garden. When I'm asked what my goal as a writer might be, my answer is this. I want to write a book that will do for a child what the secret garden did for me 70, nearly 70 years ago. And this is very close to what I'd like to do as ambassador. I'd like to encourage, no, urge young people and everybody who has anything to do with the young to read for your life. Read for knowledge and understanding and for delight. 
read for your life as a member of a family, as a part of a community, as a citizen both of this country and a citizen of the world. Expand and enrich your life by reading aloud within the family and the classroom. Read about people who are different from yourself, about ideas that are foreign to your own. Think about what you read and discuss it with other people in your life. Listen with respect to others' opinions. We seem to need a lot of practice doing that these days. And thoughtfully examine your own ideas. I was once in a school in Iowa that was organized into book clubs. After the book had been read, the students would discuss it. But there was an important rule everyone had to follow. You couldn't give your own opinion until you summarized to the satisfaction of the previous speaker what he or she had said. When the school expanded the program to include parents, the students were shocked at how often the adults failed to obey this cardinal rule. Often it was their own beloved parents who were rudely interrupting and injecting their own thoughts before carefully listening to and repeating what was being said by a neighbor. Read for your life. The summer I was 17 years old, I, who was born in China, was rooming with a friend who was born in Africa. One night after the workday was over, Mary began to read aloud to me Alan Payton's Cry the Beloved Country. At first, it was just the sound of Mary's African haunted voice caressing the beauty of Payton's language that kept me awake and enthralled. But gradually, chapter by chapter, the beauty told me of the unspeakable oppression and tragedy that was South Africa's story for too many years. I'm not sure exactly when it happened. I think the book was over. But suddenly one night as I lay on my narrow bed, the book came alive for me in a new way. I saw for the first time that the tragedy of South Africa was the tragedy of the American South in which I, as a white person, lived exempt. I began to cry, sob rather, for my own thoughtless sins and the sins of my people. I look back on those tears as a turning point in my young life. Of course, I did not leave all my sins and fears behind me on that wet pillow. But I know that my life began to change that night because of a book. So what I want to say for the next two years, starting this morning with my own grandchildren and to the young people who are with us today and have come to join this celebration, what I want to say is read for your life. And I thank you so much, all of you. Someone calling? Yeah, yeah. If you have a mic, that would be great. There are two right there, one, one person and the other. Uh, what is your personal favorite book? What is my personal favorite book? <sighs> that, that I wrote or that I read? You read. That I read. Depends on how, when, when you're talking about. Um, when I was about your age, my favorite book was The Yearling by Marjorie Kennan Rollins. Um, and it's very interesting to me that I reread that book not too many years ago because somebody wanted me to write an article about a book that had influenced me as a child. And I read that book and I thought, oh my gosh, my own books are so influenced by this book, it's almost embarrassing. <laughs> so yes, I am influenced by what I read, even if, even if unconsciously. So if you haven't read that book, I think you'll love it. I think the young woman in the white shirt right there was next. What gave you the idea to write Bridge to Terabithia? What gave me the idea to write Bridge to Terabithia? Well, uh, he's standing right here, I mean, sitting right here. Uh, <laughs> our son David, when he was eight years old, his best friend was a girl named Lisa Hill. 
And the summer after they uh, were both eight years old, she was struck and killed by lightning. And I didn't know how, what to do. I mean, of course, I, if I could have done anything I wanted to, I would have brought Lisa back from the dead, but I couldn't do that. And I couldn't even comfort my son. So I did what writers often do when they can't do what they want to do, they write a book. Because I thought it, if I wrote a book, the story has to make sense. Uh, life sometimes doesn't seem to, but stories have to. And so I began to write a story about a friendship between a boy and a girl. Take a pick, uh, Jerry. <laughs> what, in what inspired you to write Jacob Have I Loved? What inspired me to write Jacob Have I Loved? Well, <laughs> I, was, I was at a friend's house and she said something about, well, you know, my mother always loved my brother best. And I thought, really? And you're 50 years old and you're still worried about that? <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I had another friend who said to me, well, you know, if my sister hadn't done so and so when I was seven years old, and I thought, doesn't your sister get a statute of limitations? On what? <laughs> you know, I thought, this is really a problem to be carrying your childhood jealousies all the way in, into your adult life. So I thought, that would make a wonderful story. I thought it was other people's problems until I started writing the book. And every day I went to work, I was so angry I couldn't work. And I thought, hmm, probably not other people's problems. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, that was what started the story. Um, what was it like to have a book like Bridget Terabithia made into a movie? Well, um, of course, um, most of my friends who've had books made into movies are very unhappy about it uh, because the movie and the book don't have anything much to do with each other. But I had entrusted this project to David, our son, uh, and he wrote the original script and then he finally got somebody who would put up the money to make the movie and then he fought, 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 fought to keep the movie as close to the, to the story as he possibly could. And I, f I feel like we didn't win every single battle, but we won the major battles. And so I'm one of the few people I know, few writers I know who really enjoy, kind of enjoyed the movie based on their book. I mean, I've seen it five times and I've cried every time. So, <laughs> and not from anger. <laughs> I, I, my friend uh, Lois Lara, uh, uh, Betsy Byers, it was, she has the throw up test. Oh, first, one of her books made into a movie, she went, she went and threw up in the bathroom. And so I think, uh, I didn't come close to throwing up watching that. <laughs> I've come a little close on some of the others, but not on that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite author? Do I have a favorite author? If I said I had a favorite author, I would lose 99% of my friends. Right? <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm very careful not to uh, say that unless they're dead. <laughs> uh, I, li I like Leo Tolstoy and uh, Ingrid. <laughs> so uh, very much. Uh, I, I, although I'm afraid I haven't read him in the original, Dr. Billington, <laughs> which I'm sure you had. Are you going to be writing any more books so, anytime soon? I, I try, I try. <laughs> yes, I'd like to have, I'd like to leave an unfinished book on my desk when I die that nobody got this family, nobody will publish. <laughs> um, do you have any advice to a young writer? Read. Of course, if you write, that's fine too, but I think, I think reading is what taught me how to write, because you figure out how language works, how story works uh, by reading. And you don't have to read all wonderful things because you also learn what not to do if you read bad books. So sometimes it helps to read bad ones as well. 
or poorly written ones is the word I mean. <laughs> How do you get the inspiration for most of your books? Like, What kind of experiences help form the idea in your mind? Uh, well, I get ideas wherever I can because I'm not one of these people who's just bubbling over with ideas all the time. In fact, when I finish a book, I think, well, that was a nice career while it lasted. <laughs> and, and then I get very grumpy, and so somebody in my family will say, oh, go write a book because, <laughs> because I'm much happier when I write a book. But, you know, things happen. Uh, I just told you about the origin of, of Bridget Arabithia and Jacob I Love. Um, Greg Gilly Hopkins, uh, my husband and I were uh, temporary foster parents for a short time. And I realized I wasn't a good foster mother. And I had to ask myself why. And I thought, I can hear myself saying to myself, not out loud, but to myself, well, I can't settle that problem. They're only gonna be here for a short time. Or thank heavens, they're only gonna be here for a short time. And I realized what I was doing was treating two human beings as though they were disposable. And I thought, how would you feel if you thought people considered you disposable? And I decided I would be very angry. I didn't realize until after the book was published that I had two foster children, one of whom would, was William Ernest, who would uh, dry up and blow away if anybody looked at him. So, uh, ideally, I would like to be the angry, gutsy Gilly Hopkins, but there <laughs> might have been William Ernest. <laughs> About what time did you um, write Bridget Terabithia? Long before you were born. <laughs> uh, Bridget Terabithia was, was, I started writing at 19. 75. It was published in 1977, and uh, so that's been a while. <clears throat> was Bridge to Terabithia your first book that you wrote? No, I, that was my fourth book. I'd written three books set in, in feudal Japan before that uh, because I had lived in Japan and I was a little bit homesick for Japan, so I started writing about Japan. What do you feel like when you're writing? What did I, what like, do I feel like when I write? Yeah. I feel like I, uh, I love writing because it, unlike speaking, when I have to worry about if my hair got too blown off when I was coming from the taxi to the library or, you know, am I wearing the right clothes? When, I, when I'm writing, I don't think about myself. I've entered a, a new world, and uh, I'm different people. Uh, and people say, well, you know, when bad things happen to your characters, do you care? Of course I care. I mean, when I knew in the next chapter that, that uh, Leslie Burke was going to die, I stopped writing, because that's the only way I could keep her alive. Uh, so, of course, it hurts me when things hurt my characters. And sometimes, you know, I don't know how things are, so I have to walk around and, you know, try to put my body in different positions to see <laughs> how it does. But it's, it's a wonderful, um, it's wonderful work if you can get it, really, because <laughs> you get to live all different kinds of lives. Um, I think There's maybe... Three more questions uh, here, maybe. Yep. And I'll try not to make such long answers. What's your favorite book that you wrote? That's, I think that's my favorite question. Uh, and, and I understand that because I'm always curious uh, um, with my writer friends, which is their favorite book. But I really, you know, some days I, I like one book and I think, oh yeah, come on, let's be honest, that's really your favorite book. And then I, another day I'll be reading something from an, another book and I think, hmm. So it's really, it, you know, it's like my four children, none of them are perfect, but I, <laughs> I have a different relationship with each one of them. And so uh, I couldn't possibly say which is my favorite child because I have a different relationship with each child and I have a different relationship with each book. Uh, does that make sense to you? How 
How many books have you written? Somebody counted it for me yesterday. Uh, they said there were 39 books with my name on the cover. Uh, but a couple of those were translations, so they don't, you know, I didn't write them. And uh, three of them I, I wrote with my husband, so I only get half credit for that. <laughs> so it's a little hard to say, but something over 30, you know. Oh, well, thank you, John, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.